Hello and welcome to another episode of Twimmel Talk, the podcast where I interview interesting people doing interesting things in machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. Once again, the recording you're about to hear is part of a series of interviews I recorded live from the O'Reilly AI and Strata conferences in New York City. My guest this time is Pascal Fung, Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Pascal gave a really interesting presentation at the AI conference focused on how we teach computers and robots to understand human emotion and be empathetic. She also had some really interesting things to say about the theoretical foundations of the various modern approaches to speech understanding. And we dig into all of this in our conversation. As always, I'll be linking to Pascal and her research in the show notes, which you'll be able to find at twimlai.com slash talk slash nine. As is unfortunately the case with my other field recordings, there's a bit of unavoidable background noise, but it's not too bad. And now on to the show. All right. Hey, everyone. I'm here at the O'Reilly AI conference and I'm with uh, Pascal Fung, who is a professor of electrical engineering yes. at Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Right. Uh, and I sat in on her talk earlier on uh, emotions and AI and how do we enable computers to recognize emotions. And she graciously agreed to mm-hmm. spend a few minutes with us to tell us a little bit about what she's working on. Mm-hmm. So welcome, Pascal. Thank you. Uh, how about we start with talking a little bit about your background and the, the kinds of things you work on? Sure. So my background, I am an electrical engineer and computer scientist. And I've been working on speech recognition since 1988 and then moved on to statistical machine translation in the 90s. And after I became a professor at HKUST, I lead a team working on speech language and more recently on emotion and mood recognition, or sort of using um, statistical modeling and machine learning methods. Um, that's my you know, technical background. I worked at um, different places before. I was a student while, and while working on my PhD thesis at Bell Labs. Uh, I was very lucky to work um, with some of the best people uh, in the area. And uh, in the early 90s, when I started my thesis, it was when um, the the field of natural language processing was transforming from a heavily knowledge-based, linguistics-based field to statistical modeling. And at the time, statistical modeling for language was very controversial. Right. People actually didn't believe you could learn language or study language or understand language with just statistics. But, um, you know, 20 years, 20 years later, now that is the mainstream approach. Almost right. every, everything we do is with um, machine learning and statistical modeling in, in natural language processing. One of the slides you, you put up had a quote from a, a professor who I, I think you mentioned you worked with that said, for every linguist I fire, uh, I Fred increase Jalinek, the... yeah. He's, uh, he's sort of uh, uh, the father of statistical speech recognition. So we owe, the field owes a lot to him. He passed away a few years ago. And then this quote of his was, yeah, it was controversial, but... Uh, what, what was the quote? The quote was that uh, every time I fire a linguist, the speech recognition accuracy goes up. <laughs> so um, it came from, the at the time, at IBM, he was leading the IBM group uh, with a, a, a group of mathematicians and information theoreticians to work on the problems of uh, speech recognition, okay. which was previously... Um, worked on using knowledge-based approach in AI. And um, actually, he, his group wasn't allowed to use that approach. Uh, they Somehow they did it anyways. So there was uh, always a little bit of conflict between the knowledge-based AI community and, the um, at the time, the statistical-minded um, people. So there were papers written about the empiricists versus rationalists, Mm-hmm. Um, in the 90s, and uh, you know, there was. Uh, I remember my first conference presentation on a statistical-based natural language processing paper. 
I was yelled at by some of the senior people in the field. Wow. Um, yeah, those were the days. But now it's <laughs> totally non controversial at all because you can see, you know, machine learning is everywhere. Right. And uh, yeah. Right. So um, he said that because um, the approach he proposed, his group proposed, was very radical at the time, which is not looking at how to imitate human at all. Mm-hmm. But just looking at the input and output were of the task. So, for example, from, from for speech recognition, the input is um, speech speech wave found uh, waveforms, mm-hmm. and the output should be words, right?、Mm-hmm. And for machine translation, the input could be French, and the output should be English. Right. And they basically treated、um, all these problems as a kind of information theoretic problems to solve. Mm-hmm. So a different mathematical approach from the traditional knowledge-based AI approach at the time. Can you maybe give a thirty thousand foot background of information theory and how、uh, it plays、sure. into all this? Okay, I'll try. So information theory was invented by、uh, the entire field. Came from a paper written by Claude Shannon、yes. in 1948 called the Mathematical Theory of、uh, Communication. So、um, it basically looks at you know the information encoding.、Uh, for example, if you want to transmit、um, telephone signal、mm-hmm. you know, through telephone cable, there's only that much information you can transmit. And、uh, how many simultaneous calls can you transmit in one cable? It's limited by、uh, by, by by physics, actually. Right. And、uh, so the information theory really is talking about you know how do you encode,、um, transmit, and decode information.、Mm-hmm. So the earliest application was of course、uh, telephone systems.、Right. Um, so no coinc- so it was no accident that Claude Shannon was also at Bell Labs,、mm-hmm. and then later on, he,、um, information theory was then applied. Actually, in the at the time when Claude Shannon came up with this information theory, he already had the paper on the、um, information of language. Oh really?、Uh, yes, yes. He actually wrote a paper、uh, very early about how language can be encoded and learned. Okay, and uh, so um, he was uh, one of the earlier pioneers of AI. Even though people don't think of him always that way, I had no idea. Yes, and he actually also had a Scientific American paper on the、uh, the first chess playing game,、uh, chess playing algorithm. Okay. In the sixties, so yeah, so information theory became an entire field of research. And it's applied widely in many, many different areas.、Um, uh, most importantly, in co- telecommunications and communications.、Mm-hmm. And then, of course, in all the statistical learning、uh, field, we also use information theory. For example, we look at how <clears throat> how we can learn、uh, how we can learn to uh, uh, model a language. Uh-huh. From an information theoretic point of view, so it's more like a、uh, um, can you think of it as message encoding kind of way,、right. yeah, rather than linguistically motivated、right. way. So it's a different way of looking at、uh, mathematical approach of looking at problems. Right. You mentioned、yeah. that in your talk, and I found that fascinating. It,、mm-hmm. it never occurred to me. I think you you posed.、Uh, The idea of thinking of the machine translation problem mm-hmm. as mm-hmm. you've got this,、uh, you've got this message、uh-huh. that is you're trying to translate French to English. You've yeah, got this、yeah. message that's in noisy English. Yeah,、and、exactly. So how do you clean up the yeah, noise and yeah, get to、exactly. the true English? So, for example, is exactly that. So, for example, the word orders are different in、right. different languages. So it can be. You can think of that word reordering as a kind of a distortion, right? And then、uh, some of the words,、uh, actually in French and English, some of the words are the same, like forty percent overlap,、uh, right? Yeah, but other words are different. So you、right. can again think of a word that's different in a different language being a kind of noise. I mean, a kind of distortion. I'm sorry.、Mm-hmm. And if you can learn that distortion, then you learn the translation. So, and that is、um, information theoretic. Approach. That's what Google Translate is still based on.、Mm-hmm. So interesting. So, how starting from what are some of the、um, you know the algorithms or approaches that kind of come out of the information theory 
background? Like, how is it ap- applied more concretely to that problem? Okay, so for example, all modern speech recognition software mm-hmm. is based on the uh, noisy channel model. Okay. So the whole idea of you can train a speech recognizer uh-huh. uh, with lots of data. So right. uh, let's say voice search and all that. It's all based on uh, what other people have said. Mm-hmm. And it's based on these days millions of hours of speech data, mm-hmm. like Siri, for example. Yep. It's trained on this uh, data. And then um, it uses uh, a, a different kind of machine learning method. Mm-hmm. And uh, but mo- all these speech recognition uh, methodologies, based on one big paradigm, is still the noisy channel model, which is speech in, words out. Yeah. Right through the through this channel. Now, the latest approaches um, tr- uh, has turned part of these uh, um, these methods into using deep learning. Mm-hmm. to replace some modules, for example, replacing um, how phonemes can be modeled or replacing part of the uh, predicting what word will come after which word. Mm-hmm. So uh, some of this is uh, now enabled by deep learning, but the whole paradigm is still a, a, a information theory approach. Similarly, for, uh, for things like Google Translate, it's still based on the... Um, what I just talked about, the right. noisy channel model. Okay. And recently there's some research work on using neural net, but um, um, we haven't seen any um, commercial application that's, mm-hmm. that claims to be using neural net for, so end-to-end neural net for, for mm-hmm. machine translation yet. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so how did you, how did you um, kind uh, of get in... Not to mention all the encryption software, all that is based on information theory. Right. Yeah. Okay. So that is not my field, but that's actually a main application for for this kind of work. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Mm-hmm. How did you get into the study of emotion? How did I get into the study of emotion? Basically, we noticed that... Um, um, for So I, I've been working on spoken language understanding for, for a long time. Yeah. And uh, I've w- participated on uh, different efforts from different generations of um, virtual agents, what we call virtual assistants today. Okay. So the earliest system um, in the 80s was uh, funded by DARPA, mm-hmm. which was a ticket booking system where you call and say, I want to go from here to there, and then it's trying to... Um, uh, uh, to to book a t- ticket for you. Okay. And from that time on, th- we have seen different generations of dialogue systems. Up until today, we have Siri and Cortana. Right. And working on these dialogue systems, I've noticed that we've always sort of just look at literal meaning um, of a uh, user query. Mm-hmm. So the machine just pays attention to, you know, what is the destination, the origin city, mm-hmm. uh, how many ticks do you want, um, you know, what kind of restaurant you're looking for. So very uh, sort of um, literal interpretation of your query, mm-hmm. which means that your query has to be very clear. These days, people always complain, oh, Siri doesn't work well and right. all that. Um to us um, researchers, we can see why it doesn't work well because the system assumes uh, users to be very clear and say explicitly what they mm-hmm. really uh, want to get. Right. And you know, unless the users are lawyers, I mean, very few people talk that way. You know, <laughs> we talk naturally. We expect you to understand what I mean. Right. And uh, for example, you just laughed because you know I was trying to be funny. And that kind of information <laughs> is completely lost in our dialogue systems of previous generations. And, but it is very, very important for true communication. If we want to go, ba- go past uh, the current sort of, um, uh, sort of a plateau of understanding, we have to also incorporate the understanding of emotion, intent, and all that. Right. Uh, in addition to understanding the meaning of the words, mm-hmm. so um, that's when I started working on incorporating. So, I do not recognize. I don't work on recognizing emotion for emotion's sake. It's really okay. recognizing emotion for communications. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so it's what I that's what I call empathy module. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then when I look at um, the future applications of what we do, uh, the, some of the most immediate applications that immediate in the sense that in the next 20 to 30 years mm-hmm. we'll see widespread application will be um, healthcare and mm-hmm. elderly care because um, by the year 2050 mm-hmm. there will be more old people than young children in the world. Mm-hmm. So. And uh, so elderly care is a, it's a big area, and uh, governments will be running out of resources, human resources, to take care of these uh, mm-hmm. elderly. So they go, we're going to need a lot of machine assistance. Now, my mother lives, um, spends a lot of time alone. She's very independent. She's uh, in her 70s. She doesn't want to live with me, um, and she wants to be left alone to do her own thing. Mm-hmm. And I'm always worried and uh, in her independence, you know, I, I worry about her health. Uh, she seems healthy when I see her, but um, at her age, I want to make sure that she's fine. Uh, right now, for example, I want to know she's fine, right? right. So this kind of, uh, um, I, I want to know her, her health conditions, but also her mental conditions. Mm-hmm. So if she doesn't want to live with uh, with me now how about if i have uh, if we build a home robot who can be there uh, at her you know at her home or mm-hmm. be around around her and uh converse with her mm-hmm. sometimes just to get uh, a sense of how she's doing mm-hmm. simple things mm-hmm. right and then sends me a message so i know how she i mean or sends me a curve of her vital signs in addition to her mm-hmm. emotional state then um that will help the guilty children, <laughs> busy guilty children, but also help the elderly. Because, you know, a lot of people have um, emergency problems, like mm-hmm. a heart attack or something, right. that could have been, they could have been saved if someone knew. And then there are others who can get lonely and depressed, and, mm-hmm. um, um, and then they can also be helped by machines to some extent, mm-hmm. not completely by machines. You know, living with just machines is also very um, sad, but... Right. But when there are not enough humans around, people mm-hmm. around, then the machines can help. Mm-hmm. So this is why I want to work on empathetic uh, robots hmm. in to the take case, care of people. In the case of a crisis situation like a heart attack, mm. where does empathy and um, where think, does that come in? I think heart attack, um, it's, it's basically it's an emergency. Then the robot has to basically alert call the ambulance right that's the mm-hmm. first thing but what what empathy comes into play is that uh, so daily reminder to take medicine right uh in uh, some of the aging studies uh, mm-hmm. people have found that a lot of elderly they don't want to take medicine to some unless somebody talks to them okay <laughs> like um sometimes you have to um sort of entice them to, to i mean some elderly are like children mm-hmm. So in that case, though, the machine doesn't just say, take your medicine, and repeatedly insisting that you take your medicine, mm-hmm. like with the same command, that will be extremely annoying, mm-hmm. and it will have the opposite effect, right? Mm-hmm. So the machine needs to know that the elderly is hesitant or resisting, mm-hmm. and uh, how is the uh, person's patient's um, um, emotional state, mm. and to know whether now... Uh, the machine can insist, or it's time to call a doctor or a nurse, mm-hmm. or whether you know telling the patient a, a, a bedtime story will soothe them. Mm-hmm. Um, so that requires empathy. If you think about all the nurses, you know, in, in the hospital, a lot of their job, a lot of their work, and their tasks are very repetitive. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, sometimes the better nurses are the ones who really have a very good bedside manner. Right. And what is a bedside manner other than being empathetic? Mm-hmm. Just being empathetic, you know, for both doctors and nurses. So mm-hmm. if you want doctors and nurses to be empathetic, obviously you want the healthcare robots to be empathetic. Right, right. Mm. Your talk, I interpreted its focus on uh, empathy recognition, but your description is also talking about what you might call generative empathy. Right, right. So empathy has two sides. It's the mm-hmm. re- emotion recognition right. and then the the appropriate emotional response. Okay. So empathy, I only, in my talk, I focus mostly on the emotion recognition part okay. because that is hard. Until we can recognize emotion, um, we don't know how to react, right? Right, right. So I focus on that and uh, 
But the response part,、um, I, I talked a little bit at the end that we're we're trying to learn the appropriate response、mm-hmm. as well from、uh, data. So、mm-hmm. also using、uh, deep learning.、Mm-hmm. You mentioned healthcare as a, a use case.、Uh-huh. I think there's all, often、uh, for a while now. Uh, people have talked about a customer service use case right, where right, sure, sure. you know the 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 hold line、sure. will recognize when you're getting frustrated. Sure, and- sure. In fact,、uh, at AT and T Bell Labs in the '90s already, there um, um, they uh, a group uh, worked、um, came up with a system called "How May I Help You."、Mm-hmm. So when you call the、uh, AT and T line. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a it's a virtual system, a virtual operator that talks to you first and says, "How、mm-hmm. may I help you?" And you basically say whatever you want, and then it goes to different categories. Yeah, and that is the intention classifier. Okay. And also at the time, AT 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 and T had internal programs to analyze all these call center data、right. to see whether people are upset, they're happy,、yeah. and all that. So that is already the beginning of emotion recognition. That was my first、um, contact with emotion recognition, and it was for for customer service. Indeed, it is a big area.、Um, But I don't get the sense that it's widely deployed, or at least not in a way that、um, I would see. As an everyday yeah, person, but it's, maybe it's more. Yeah, it's at the back end. end. So this is the thing because it's not consumer facing. It's really for. It's really in the in, in the area, the realm of data analytics. Yeah. So it's more of a a, a tool used by corporations to.、Um, In, improve the efficiency of their call centers and a performance management. Performance, for yeah, they do that do that.、Okay. There, are, there are companies that、um, provide technology to to customer service. Okay.、This. Yeah. Yeah, because that my my yeah, place in line never seems to accelerate because I'm、yeah. angry. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right.、Um, so you also talked about.、Um, The use of convolutional neural nets、uh-huh. in recognizing emotion、mm-hmm. and kind of drew some interesting correlations across.、Um, you know, basically that the CNNs were able to、mm. functionally approximate、uh, the, the cochlear functionality. Yeah, the human、uh, sound pr-、uh, perception system. Indeed, that's what we found. So.、Um, So I think in my talk I started out by saying, okay, traditionally speech recognition look at these、uh, human, human、uh, sound perception system and try to imitate that, but we sort of hit the bottleneck and we had to move away from that and、uh, go with the information theoretic approach where we actually try to, we don't try to imitate human model at all. And what's interesting with CNN is that、uh, a lot of times CNN or other deep neural net. Are being used as a black box,、mm-hmm. so we know it works. We don't、right. know why. Right. And、uh, humans, being humans, are always interested in knowing why. Right. And in fact, there is a a,、um, a practical reason is that if you ever want to commercialize a technology like that, right, to provide to your customers, they want to know why,、right. what it's learning. Right. So,、um, so we then look take we then took a look at the CNN, at different layers of CNN, and saw that it was actually,、um, as I mentioned in my talk, that. It's basically approximating the filter bank in our cochlea、mm-hmm. um, that's connected to the auditory system, and then we also saw that it's picking up on the、uh, amplitude, the peaks in the amplitude、mm-hmm. that correspond to different emotions. So we thought that was very interesting that we could actually see、uh, what's going on. For example,、uh, it was always、um, uh, CNN was first applied to image recognition. And、um, they use like seven, eight, nine layers of um, um, CNN to achieve that purpose. And in image recognition, they were able to see that each layer. So, for example, one layer is recognizing the edges of an image, and the other layer is recognizing um, um, maybe something else, some features in, on your face, and all that.、Mm-hmm. So it's all very obvious and really nice. And we were never able to explain how deep neural networks on speech. And language, so it was interesting to see why it works on emotion.、Mm-hmm. We still are not able to figure out what it's doing on languages. So what、mm-hmm. each layer is recognizing,、mm-hmm. uh, we were hoping that、uh, each layer will correspond to some linguistic、um, functions, such as、right. syntax or semantic. We haven't seen anything that 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 neat yet.、Hmm. So interesting. interesting. Yeah. 
So it's not blindly learning learning something. It's learning something、uh, which has a physical meaning. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. but you made the point that it's it's also an error to correlate it too tightly to brain function because that doesn't really work. It doesn't. It's not because no. So even though I said approximates humans' perception system, it's really the hearing system, right?、Uh, right. It's not the understanding part. It's、right. the hearing system, and we know exactly how our hearing system function. Okay. We know very very well. We don't guess, but how? How our minds function in understanding the meaning, we don't know.、Mm-hmm. We we activating our, as, you know, I mentioned one hundred billion neurons and one hundred、mm-hmm. trillion synapses to get that.、Um, until we have neural network of that size, it's hard to、um, come up with something similar to human cognitive、um, ability.、Mm-hmm. So it's not. We don't have that. So that's why I say. It's no coincidence that、um, we can use, we can explain what CNN is doing for perception.、Mm-hmm. So speech recognition and emotional recognition are both perception、um, problems.、Mm-hmm. Perception is actually、uh, easy because we understand human perception, how how our skin feels, the temperature. We actually understand the physics of that very、uh-huh. very well. But once you go into understanding, which is language understanding, which、right. is the trans, you know, if I want to use a noisy channel model, it would be from words to meaning. Right. Once we get into the realm of that,、uh, we are kind of clueless as to how humans. So there are a lot of linguistic theories about how humans think, how、yeah. humans understand. But you know, for every linguistic theory, there are other people who will say no. Right. So there is no. No,、um, there's no scientific truth that we all share right now about、mm-hmm. how human mind understands language or understands anything else.、Mm-hmm. How do you know a video of a cat is funny or not? How does our mind interpret humor? We actually don't know.、Right. A lot of marketers would like、right. to be able to. I know. So that,、right? yeah, how do you predict? For example, one thing、uh, we were asked since we could classify music, we were asked by a company to say, "Hey, can you predict whether a song is going to be a hit or not?"、Mm-hmm. Well, if we could predict that, <laughs> wouldn't that be amazing?、Right. Uh, no, you know, because you know, even we look at big data of all the past、um, hit songs. Yeah. It can't learn. It cannot predict what the next one. Not yet.、Uh, maybe.、Right. So all we can do right now is use engineering models to approximate input and output.、Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's really a mimicry. Like just looking at this input, can we come up with output that's similar to to the truth?、Mm-hmm. So we're not no we're not in any way near to、um, imitating human minds,、mm-hmm. and that would be even though so even the term deep learning is a new term for something that has been around for a while. So、mm-hmm. it's a particular kind of machine learning. Right. It is.、Uh, it is no deeper, let's say, than other kind of machine learning methods. <laughs> it's it's a terminology and also.、Um, Neural network—it's、um, a very, very rudimentary kind of neural network. You know, for speech recognition, there might be tens of thousands of neurons,、mm-hmm. and for emotional recognition, much, much fewer.、Mm-hmm. So that cannot compare to the human brain. So,、mm-hmm. yeah. One of the things that I noticed in your presentation is the、um, when you're doing the emotional. Emotion recognition. You're mapping it to kind of the you know these names, common names we have for emotion: angry, sad. Yeah,、whatever. right, right. Is that model even too simple, or is there an underlying, more nuanced model for emotion? I'm, yeah. I'm sure there. Yeah, there are. well, so、um, there's a lot of research done on the underlying model for emotion, such as、uh, valence arousal,、mm-hmm. you know, and、uh, there are models that try to predict that first before they predict the. Final label. And to interrupt you, because I saw the slide, but these folks haven't. Valence、mm. arousal is valence is like the strength of the emotion, and no arousal is the strength. Okay. Valence is the positive and negative of the emotion. And so the various, you know, angry, sad, cool. Yeah, get it's a combination of yeah.、Right. They are a combination of different values of valence and arousal. This is one emotion theory. So these are models that、uh, psychologists came up with. Uh huh. To try to organize what we know about emotion,、uh, 
And um, so it's just human minds, we're symbolic animals. You know, we need to have mm -hmm. names. We give right. names to everything. Yeah. So it's just easier for us to give a name to emotions so we know what we're talking about. Yeah. Rather than give this vague, uh, you know, number. Right. Uh, of valence arousal. If I tell you, oh, this is valence arousal, this and this number, right. you wouldn't know what I'm talking about. If I say he's, you know, he's showing happiness on his face, you kind of, kind of um, know. So it's kind of um, emotional recognition. It's kind of like speech recognition when it was only recognizing um, isolated words. Mm -hmm. It's oversimplified for sure. Yeah. Uh, we're not good at all with emotional recognition. You saw my slides. The performance is nowhere near the ability, uh, the performance of recognizing words. Recognizing right. emotion is much harder right, right now. One reason, as you pointed out, is that it's hard to define what emotion is. You know, yeah. mm, for example, uh, maybe it's easy to see if somebody's happy, but is he smiling because he's happy, or is he smiling because he's trying to be polite? Right. And uh, also, what about emotions like frustration? How can you tell? Um, sure, some 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 things are obvious. You know, when someone's frustrated if they're rolling their eyes or something. <laughs> but there are other times, you know, from the voice, from the tone of your voice, we can tell a lot of things. Right. But we cannot tell uh, everything um, all the time. So it is a long ways to go. You saw the accuracy. The accuracy these days, even the best commercial systems, is just like 60%, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and most 70%. And speech recognition, we're talking about above 90%. Right. Right? So... There's a long way to go for emotional recognition, and especially some more complex emotions like humor. Yeah, sarcasm, I think. Sarcasm, you mentioned. yes, sarcasm and humor and um, and uh, deceit. You know, is this person lying? Right. And there are colleagues in the field who have come up with systems that that has seventy some percent accuracy in detecting deceit and mm. actually performs better than humans. Turns out we're not very good at detecting <laughs> deceit. We're not good at all. Wow. And humans are not very good in uh, recognizing emotions. Yeah. Uh, you know what we found with uh, when we did some human subject studies is that we found that um, women are better. <laughs> Uh -huh. Women no are more empathetic than men. Uh -huh. um, there was actually um, quantifiable. And then women can detect emotion across languages. Language, in languages they don't know. Interesting. Also better than men in the same language. <laughs> um, so you can talk about why the reason, you know, we're programmed to be mothers. We right, must recognize right. the emotion of a baby early on. And I think there's some merit to that. So mm -hmm. Although I, I'm not an anthropologist, I cannot prove that. But mm -hmm. yeah, so... Interesting. Um, and then the reasons, you know, you see there are a lot of women who are nurses. Doesn't mean men cannot be, but it just happened that way. Right. A lot of the uh, caregivers are women, you know, kindergarten teachers, um, you know, just nannies, you know. Mm -hmm. So if we want to build robots, we want them to be more like that, right. more empathetic. Yeah. Right. Great. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to sit down with me. It was a great discussion. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank um, you. Would you like to share how folks can find your research or are you on any of the social media um, networks? Well, it's easy to Google my name, okay. which is Pascal Fong, P-A-S-C-A-L-E. Fong is F-U-N-G. If you Google my name, you will come to my uh, website, which lists all my our publications, our projects, and all that. And if they're interested, they can they can email me uh, via that website as well. Great, right? Great. Well, thanks so much. Thank you. All right, everyone. That's it for today's show. If you enjoyed this show or have something to add to the discussion, please leave a comment on the show notes page at twimlai.com slash talk slash nine. Or tweet to me at, at Sam Charrington or at Twimmel AI to let me know what you think. Thanks so much for listening and catch you next time.